Well, hello everyone. Today is June 30th and welcome to our uh, community call. Uh, today we have a special guest in David Ehrlichman to discuss uh, the wonderful book of Impact Networks, which thank you again to, to Jules to recommending this one. Uh, and we had a reading group earlier in the week where we got to really start thinking about uh, impact networks and how they pertain to what we're doing here at SCURF and trying to impact networks around research and everything. So yeah, super excited to get more into that. Uh, but I don't want to belabor on my rambles. So I will hand it off to David to introduce himself and uh, mention uh, a bit about the book, and then we will get into a group discussion pertaining to impact networks and, and networks for research. Uh, so yeah, with that, let's welcome David. All right, thank you, Eugene. Uh, thanks for the invitation here. It's good to be here, here with everybody. And I'm gonna approach this conversation a little bit differently than I would a lot of other presentations because Many of you have already been exposed to the book. You've had conversations about it. Uh, my intention here is to, first I'll share just a little bit about my background and how I got into this work. And then I'm gonna share the shortest possible overview of the context of why this book exists and why this work exists. But then I'm really just gonna go kind of section by section, like one concept at a time and wanna stop and pause at each one and then talk with you all about, you know, how does this, apply to SCURF and, and what are the implications for this and really have a, a discussion with each point. So if that works, uh, you're also free to, to put questions in the chat. Uh, we can track them as we go. Um, but, uh, but I do hope that you will come off mute, uh, maybe even come off video uh, and, and we'll talk it through. So just a little bit about my background. My journey into this work really started about 15 years ago. I was working with a nonprofit organization here in the Seattle area, which is where I am now and where I was born. And that organization, still around today, does awesome work, helps people without shelter to get training and find jobs in the food industry. Uh, but I was noticing when I was there that uh, it, it, it seemed like they were addressing the symptoms of this massive broken system. Uh, there's just a constant uh, lack of affordable housing here in the city, so many issues that affect homelessness. Uh, and, and I was also noticing how they were primarily working alone as an individual organization. They're really focused on their own organizational uh, uh, sustainability and growth, but, but not really working with others uh, across different sectors. So I got really curious. My guiding question then was, you know, how can we work across boundaries, across sectors, across organizations, to address these big complex issues that that require perspectives from across the system and that there's no single right answer there's no single action that's going to make the difference we have to approach these issues with a smart coordinated effort so you know, long story short that led me first to monitor institute for a year and then to, to fresno california and i was the founding coordinator for a network of I ended up being 48 different leaders and their organizations to revitalize the city across all different sectors, people who were in direct kind of opposition on different issues, the superintendent and the charter schools advocate and the you know, enlightened property developer with the environmental activist. But actually, when you dig deep enough, you find that there's a lot of common ground. And we find those underlying values, kind of the shared care for the place or for some purpose. And they disagree on a lot of different things. but often we can find some slice of common ground where we do agree and we can work on that thing, or at least create different types of conversations and different types of connections so that we have a baseline of mutual respect and we can have a greater appreciation for each other's perspectives and have a, a greater understanding of what's actually going on across the whole system instead of just seeing our slice of the picture. So that led me to the Santa Cruz Mountains region. I was also the founding coordinator there for a network that was 24 organizations working to steward half a million acres of land. Uh, and that's that's uh, very clearly requires a network approach, a collaborative approach, because if you get rid of the invasive species on your parcel of land and your neighbor hasn't done the same, it doesn't much matter what you've done, right? So you have to work systemically. You have to work across these boundaries. And that means in that case, that's bringing together the government agencies, state, local, federal, the land trusts, the academic institutions, the timber companies and the tribal groups to actually get together and figure out where they agree, where they disagree, look at the whole system and identifying opportunities to, to affect the whole system in ways that no single organization can. So that led me to, to launch Converge in 2013. And Converge is itself a network that supports other networks. And, and since then, the last eight, nine years, 
We've uh, been able to work with over 50 different imp impact networks, all social, environmental focus, so all purpose driven work, uh, but really across four different continents all around the world, really different issue areas. And what's uh, uh, been valuable about our position as a consultant in that, in that space is, is seeing that each network has been so different in terms of its history and the context and the people who are involved, but there's also really common patterns that continue to arise. There's so much that's similar in terms of how they're structured and how they form and the type of leadership that's required and the processes that they can use. So that is really what is contained in this book, along with you know, interviews and connections that I've made over the past decade. And, and that's what I want to share with you here. I want to share just the a couple key points that I think are might be particularly relevant to SCURF uh, and, and talk those through with you and, and uh, you know, have really, again, a community discussion. So uh, with that, uh, for those who haven't yet read the book, uh, I want to uh, just do the, the shortest possible overview of uh, what, what this is all about, what this work is about, uh, which is we live in this world of complexity. This complexity, it's increasing rapidly, and we know we have to work together. We have to work together across boundaries. We have to work together in unprecedented ways. To address systemic issues requires working systemically. People and organizations embark on collaborative efforts all the time, thinking they know how to do that really well, but so often frustrated by the results. There is this term out there even called collaboration fatigue. Right? Collaboration is really hard. We get burned out. We'd rather just do things alone. Often, I think it's because people are approaching these collaborations all wrong. Either they're trying to structure these collaborations like they would an organization with a hierarchy, some central authority really directing the work and people fitting into specific seats to move it forward, and trying to plan it all out well in advance, right? identifying really specific and measurable outcomes for the effort before people have even had a chance to connect together, have conversations, and actually bring their different perspectives together and discover what they can and want to do together. And then we can identify those specific measurable outcomes off of that. So rather than top down, I really advocate for more of that bottom up community driven approach. Because complex issues can't be held by any single person. There's too much. They're experienced so differently by different people. People are affected by these issues in different ways. They see things really differently depending on where they stand. And so in addressing complex issues, we can't plan everything out in advance unilaterally. We have to actually bring different actors, different sectors, different organizations often together to collectively make sense of the issue to strengthen their ability then to share information, share resources, to accelerate those flows, to strengthen connections, as well as accelerate flows, and then to affect the system in no way in ways that no one group could on their own. And that's really what it means to build a network for impact. And just to be clear, this work is, is not new, right? People have always formed networks. We've always worked in community with others to solve challenges that we can't on our own. And so, in many ways with this work, I'm talking about a return to the ways that humans have naturally connected with one another as long as we've been around in relationship, in community. And in many ways, I'm, I'm calling for an unlearning of the top-down command and control model that's been imposed on so much of the world. And so we can build on lessons from social movements and community building and community organizing and indigenous wisdom and generations of people who have worked in these ways for thousands of years and then we can also bring in new lessons from network science and systems thinking and incorporate new tools and technologies that allow us to coordinate at larger and larger scales than ever before. And, and ultimately, though, it, it really comes down to bringing people together around some shared purpose or shared issue around whatever lights a fire in us, right? Finding where that energy is and then fostering connection, learning and action around that shared purpose, really building healthier systems in that way. I love this quote from Margaret Wheatley. The world doesn't change one person at a time. It changes as networks of relationships form among people who discover they share a common cause and a vision for what's possible. And she says, our work is not to create critical mass, it's to foster critical connections. Right? So not critical mass, but critical connections. So that's really what, what this book is about. It's about how we can move it beyond this paradigm of command and control and top-down decision-making to address complex issues by cultivating these vibrant, self-organizing, and decentralized networks. 
just a tiny bit more context and we'll we'll open it up here. So networks are everywhere, right? There are many different forms of networks. At the most basic definition, networks are webs of relationships connecting people or things. So there are there are neural networks in our brains, there are technological networks like the internet, there are fungal networks, the mycelial networks underneath the forest floor that connect trees and plants together. And of course, there are social networks. We all know about social networks. Well, what many people don't realize is that networks can be deliberately organized and supported to do a lot more than just create connection. We can foster networks, not just for connection, but also for learning, increasing the flow of information and resources, also for action, collective action, collaborating in different ways, and for larger social movements, really connecting multiple different networks together as part of this larger movement to shift mindsets, to change policies, whatever it might be. And so we can, we can also learn from a, a lot of prior and present examples of networks that are out there. Uh, there's just, just a couple examples, we can get into these more later, a lot of these are in the book. But there's the, the REAMP network, which has been around since 2005, which brings together over 140 different organizations to equitably reduce carbon emissions across nine states in the Midwestern United States. They've had really tremendous impact. They've shut down over 100 different coal plants. They've stopped all new coal plants from being built, passed energy efficiency policies and transportation efficiency policies. There are also then uh, networks that, that aren't really focused on collaborative action together, but really focused on learning, on increasing the flow of information resources between one another. The IMPT is a great example, the Initiative for Multipurpose Prevention Technologies, and they bring, uh, they, they are really about fostering the development of these MPTs, these multipurpose prevention technologies, which provide STI prevention and contraception for women. Those products don't currently exist or are, are not accessible. And, and so they connect academic researchers and product developers and funders and advocates together across this global network that's really accelerating the development of these products and bringing them to market. Lots more examples we can get them, but, uh, but they really follow similar patterns. And uh, this is the concept that then, uh, in just a second, uh, that I want to pause and, and talk about its implications for SCURP, which is how these networks often form usually something like this, starting out in scattered fragments. Right? Some people, some organizations know each other and work together, but overall the system is fragmented. Information isn't flowing between different clusters of activity. So the first step is often to, to find that shared thing, the purpose, the issue that brings people together, and actually for someone or some organization to play that role of catalyzing the network in the first place, connecting it together through that central hub. This is how actually the, the initiative for multipurpose prevention technologies was formed. The IMPT was Bethany Young Holt, a leader, catalyst, brought people together for the first time, again, researchers, product developers, funders, policymakers, et cetera. Uh, and, and importantly though, when we're building impact networks like this, we have to move beyond ultimately this hub and spoke stage that we're really trying to not just stop here and connect people together through you or your organization, so that you're the bottleneck in the middle, but really then evolving to what's called a multi-hub network, so that information and resources are flowing across the network from person to person and organization to organization without having to go through some centralized entity. That's not to say that that, that catalyst might not continue to play a really important role. Leadership always matters. We need groups who continue to coordinate networks and create spaces and opportunities for those connections to be made and resources and information to be flowing. So that creating the conditions and the opportunities for the network to grow and thrive is really important. But in terms of the relational structure of the network, we're really trying to move beyond that hub and spoke to this multi-hub structure. And then over time, can evolve into, it's called core periphery structure where there's really a dense core of activity where some people are, are really engaged they're sharing lots of information they're really well connected and then there's a much larger periphery of people who are bringing in new sources of information and connecting to other networks and of course this is a static picture but it's actually really fluid some people are going to come in the periphery and then they'll come into the core some people from the core will go back to the periphery and beyond and we're con and constantly engaging the, this larger system of people 
there's an important part of this, which is we're not looking for 100% engagement from every person all the time. And, and really we've seen this constant pattern of, of a 20, 40, 40 model, uh, where a, a, at any given network, impact network, at any given time, about 20% of people are really super engaged, are kind of the, the helping to lead or shape or actively contribute to the effort right, in the core. They're showing up on all the calls, they're, they're really engaging in the discussions, they're moving work forward. Then about 40% of people are somewhat engaged. They're tracking things, right? They're in the Discord or the Telegram. You can see they're seeing the messages. They're showing up to some things and not other things. So kind of, you know, somewhat engaged, partnering in the effort. Uh, and then about 40% of people are sort of MIA at any given time, right? They're not engaged. Uh, and, and so you can think of it as sort of lead, partner, follow, right? About 20% of people are kind of in that leadership mode, not actively being the leader of the effort, but really leading different things, moving things forward, right? Then about 40% of people are kind of partnering with the effort, contributing in different ways, and then the other 40% are following, a little bit MIA sometimes. And again, this is fluid, but this is just to say that this is completely normal and healthy, really. Uh, the, again, the goal is not 100% engagement all the time. That's just not realistic. It's really to find uh, how and where people want to contribute, the people who are less engaged might be worth you know, reaching out to them, having conversations where they might be able to plug in, uh, and then also really fostering the energy of the people who are in that inner 20% because they're they're bringing a lot to the party. But again, it's a really healthy part of the process. Uh, so uh, let me just stop there for a second uh, before I go on. And I want to ask you kind of at each of these sections, what are the implications here for SCURF? What's coming up for you? you know, how does this maybe apply to, to what you're trying to do here and, and what questions are coming up for you. Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump in with an initial thought, but again, would really love to just hear from, from others as well. I think part of the interesting bit about this and especially with the web of change and the way it's outlined in the book of uh, shifting away from that hub and spoke model is that the specificity of impact of networks is also very variable. And I, I at least in, in reading your book and my takeaways from that are the more clear and focused a network can be, the easier it is to do this. But at its core with what SCURF is trying to do, there are multiple missions that we are trying. I mean, it, it all falls under this broad bucket of facilitating interaction between industry and academia for the purpose of advancing research, et cetera. But given the reality of the network landscape of who that applies to, right, we're still figuring out the balance of how do we pull in, how do we find ways to add value to a governance researcher at the same time as a scaling researcher, at the same time as a cryptography researcher, while also recognizing that a person who's you know, a, a freshman undergrad pursuing this versus a tenured faculty member or anywhere in between, they will also need different points of value beyond just wanting to make things better. And so it, it's interesting, and that's one thing, sort of the, the multi-dimensionality of this feels like it adds additional complication because if our goal was just to advance research on a super narrow question, then this would feel more clear. But because we're looking to advance on a wider scope of questions, it can feel like the chicken and the egg problem of where do we get started with different points of this. Um, so yeah, I, uh, that's sort of a one element that I keep coming back to is sort of how are we trying to slice it and do we end up, would we end up overfitting no matter what because we are trying to more provide the room for all of these sub networks to emerge where more narrow uh, progress can be achieved, but we pull them together under the SCURF umbrella. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's sort of a, at least something that frequently comes to mind when thinking about it. But yeah, I see Chris has his hand up. And yeah, please, uh, if anyone, I see Stephanie also dropped a question and James, so I'll read those out. Uh, so yeah, please feel free to drop your questions in chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you. But yeah, Chris, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think from my perspective, one of the things that has really validated SCURF uh, from reading the book is that I feel that we've been trying to react to the industry and academia in a way that allows us to uh, create 
a hub network or a hub that was bringing together different types of action and learning networks um, before we had the proper frameworks to fit them. But now that I think looking at the way that it was presented in the book across many different types of organizations, the simple approach of learning versus action, I think made it uh, really apparent that if we have two focus, like a focus of learning on in one aspect of the organization and how we're trying to either learn about industry or learn uh, how to apply academic theory while then having another part of the organization that acts, it makes it a lot easier to articulate. You know, it's like 60% learning, 40% action um, to then make it more clear to see where we are within our own evolution. So I think this was a very well-timed uh, framework for SCURF because SCURF is a, it's a reactionary and a proactive organization in the way we're trying to uh, combine or I guess facilitate connections between networks. But now having this framework, um, obviously we're still evolving, but I do, I do feel like it has helped me understand a lot better how SCURF can play a better facilitating role to know when we're facilitating learning versus when we're facilitating action. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, one thing I would add to that, I'll pull in this, uh, this diagram here, which is, yeah, there are different types of networks. Let me actually go to this one. Uh, so you know, not uh, the networks take different forms depending on their intended function, right? Let me increase the size of this. So you know, we all know about social networks, primarily connection, then different forms of impact networks. Some one learning network, which is really about accelerating the flows of information and learning. I mentioned the IMPT before. Action networks, which really do all that and also are kind of deliberately trying to organize people together to facilitate collaboration or deeper levels of, of coordination between them. But then movement networks, which I think maybe is you know, an approach for SCURF, which is there, uh, SCURF is thinking about multiple different networks, right? That maybe have different focuses that have different forms and structures. But then SCURF is playing also a role to connect them all together as part of this larger research movement. So you can think of you know, SCURF being in the middle of this, uh, this uh, hub in the in the movement network here, you know, fostering the the growth and development of multiple different types of networks that take different forms, that have different issue focuses, uh, different research aims, uh, but they're learning from one another as well. Uh, they're sharing resources when appropriate. You know, there are bridges between them so that uh, that those efforts are mutually reinforcing. I see a hand from Umar. Hey. Um... So just uh, listening to this, I was immediately started thinking about our um, one of the projects we're running is on peer review, and we're pulling together I think like twelve organizations next week um, to have like a a convening and and discuss and like start making those connections um, across multiple networks, and um, I'm I'm really curious about the transition from that sort of like hub and spoke model to increasingly like having those connections across the individual nodes in the network and just like how that process um, happens, takes place um, and, and like concrete uh, strategies for helping make sure it happens. Sure. Uh, to answer that, I can actually skip forward a little bit um, and go to the, the part of this deck, which is really about the how. Um, well, this is, uh, first of all, this, this might be relevant, interesting, which is, you know, often individuals and especially organizations kind of move forward in the world, seeing themselves at the center of their work, the center of their focus, and then with the other different stakeholders and folks around them that they could collaborate with to further their own mission. But the shift here that we're trying to get to in building networks is to, to put a shared purpose or a shared issue or shared aim at the center of people's focus and then seeing that we're we're not the sun at the center of a solar system we're one star in this huge and diverse constellation right so rather than putting yourself or your organization at the center of your focus all the time try 
how do we put the issue or the common purpose at the center and then see the other groups around us that we can connect with to advance that shared purpose. And as we strengthen those connections and strengthen those flows, that's really what it means to build a network. And so that's also uh, one of the first steps of, of building an impact network. To Eugene's point, you know, the more you can bound the focus of a particular network, uh, the easier it's going to be to, to find the right people, to foster those connections and so forth. So bounding around you know, a tight issue or sometimes a geography or population or a combination of all the above. The more tightly you can bound it, uh, the easier it is. There's a quote from Charles Vogel, community without boundaries is no community at all, right? So boundaries are actually important. What does it mean to be a part of this, this network and what's the thing that we're really focused on? So these are kind of the, the five activities around how uh, to get to umar's question you know, how we actually uh strengthen these networks from hub and spoke to to a multi-hub and, and a core periphery network clarifying purpose and principles convening the people cultivating trust coordinating actions and collaborating for systems change just to go into each one of them really briefly and we can stop and discuss you know, purpose is is what inspires people to join right? impact networks they can't really be controlled but they can be oriented around that shared purpose. And then as we clarify purpose, principles are really helpful to cohere the different actions and decisions of the network. The so principles are the fundamental beliefs about how people in the network intend to conduct themselves in pursuit of that purpose. So values are the things that we hold as important, but principles are actually how are we going to operationalize those? When we're making decisions, when we're taking actions, what are the things that we're falling back on, right? What are our kind of collective agreements of what it means to be in this network and how we're gonna to work together? So principles are, are really a key part also of how movement networks stay connected together. So then we, we create opportunities for people to become connected, to to share information, have conversations they don't usually have with people they don't usually have them with. Who do we bring together in a network? A, a, a good guideline from Adrian Ray Brown is people who are directly impacted by the issue, people who are doing compelling work on the issue, and then people who can move the work forward. And, and when we're convening people, we're not convening them into our thing. It's really inviting them into co-creating what's possible now that they're part of the group. So it's a different orientation there. And I really believe in in the importance of of deep relationships and of trust. Uh, that it means taking the time to actually understand what each other cares about and needs to to really have the honest conversations that are necessary. And it's not so that we like each other. We actually don't need to like each other to be able to work together. We don't need to know any identif personal identifying information either, so we can maintain anonymity if we want to. But we can build kind of a deeper level of mutual understanding and respect and, and a deeper understanding of why each other cares about this issue that's bringing us together as well, kind of what are our underlying motivations and so forth, not just what do we want to do on it, but why do we care about it? We do that so that we can actually disagree. Right? It's not so that we agree on the thing, it's so that we can actually hold the tension through the inevitable disagreements and miscommunications that are going to arise, because those always are gonna happen. And if we haven't created any kind of semblance of relationship and we run into disagreement or miscommunication, often then we just break it off and we turn, it's not worth it, right? But if there is that kind of shared uh, a baseline level of mutual respect, what you might call trust, then we can turn back towards that person and have that conversation to dig into whatever that issue was. And then we're looking to, to coordinate actions, to kind of build on the things that are already happening, right? What's already happening across this system? What's the work that's <clears throat> already being done? How can we learn and build on those things that are already happening by, by accelerating the flows of information and resources and knowledge across the network? Because those flows really create stronger systems. And just, you can see the evolution. This is from a network that I developed in New York City. It's around economic mobility. And this, this map was captured before the network convened together for the first time. You can see it's kind of that scattered fragments. You know, some people have connections, but by and large not. Right here, the, the nodes represent the individual leaders and therefore their organizations as a, as a proxy in the network. The colors are their primary sector. And then the connecting lines in this case is, is regular flows of information between them. So again, this is before the network convened for the first time. And here we are a year later, right? We've kind of 
now gone more to that multi-hub structure. The network also is continually asking you know, who else needs to be involved. So it brought in the purple sector here. And then over the next year, it brought in the yellow sector, which wasn't there before. And you can see we have that really dense core periphery structure. And so you know, each of these activities there, it's not, you know, check the box, it's not necessarily even linear. Uh, we're constantly engaging with each of them, right? We're constantly deepening our understanding of what brings us together and, and what the principles are, who else needs to be involved, we're strengthening the relationships, we're accelerating the flows of information between us. I'm going to skip this one for now. And then we're identifying, you know, what are the things we can do together that we can't do alone? Uh, in in the case of social impact networks in, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, with that example I shared before, one example there was the different agencies pooled together their data sources for the first time to really create this massive region-wide vegetation map, which was reducing the risk of catastrophic wildfire. So something they couldn't do alone. You can also do systems mapping efforts. This is from 100K and 10, which is a big network of 300 different partners working to uh, train and support 100,000 STEM, high quality STEM teachers across the United States in 10 years. They actually just achieved that goal last year, 2021. And one of the things they did was this big systems mapping effort where they surveyed lots of different people uh, from across the system, teachers, and superintendents, and everyone in between to identify kind of what are the key issues that are, are getting in the way of our ability to have high quality STEM teachers, and then how are those issues uh, related to one another? And pooling all the data together, created this, this systems map, which kind of identified some really clusters of activity, some key focus areas that a, a, a focused push uh, or uh, you know, targeted effort on these different focus areas would have ripple effects throughout the system. So these were that, how they identified leverage points, the places that Nella Meadows talks about, where a focused effort on one thing is going to produce big changes in everything. Uh, let me just stop there. Uh, actually, two more things um, that are really important uh, in, in building those networks uh, and going from that, that hub and spoke to the multi-hub and core periphery. And number one is leadership. Many people assume that networks like this just happen, that people are going to self-organize spontaneously. But in reality, that really only goes so far. Leadership always matters. It's just a really different form of leadership than we see in hierarchical environments. Right. So rather than defining rigid structures and rules that fit people into specific boxes, it's really about nurturing a culture of trust and reciprocity. And instead of command and control, it's about connecting and collaborating people. It's not about you're not telling people what to do, but you are fostering self-organization and supporting people to discover what they can and want to do together. So it's really more about cultivating the conditions for connection and learning and action around a shared purpose than it is managing people and fitting them into specific boxes, right? And there are uh, some key leadership roles that continue to come up over and over again. Uh, four that I've seen are really common are catalyzing, facilitation, weaving, and coordination. And these are often played by different people. And so really anybody in a network is, is invited to, to step into leadership in different ways they want to, and, and leadership can take different forms. So catalyzing is, is the act of bringing the network together in the first place, but it's also kind of catalyzing a, a focus, a, a new subgroup or a team, or it's catalyzing a conversation. It's starting something, right? Bringing people together around something. And then facilitation, the actual act of facilitating meetings, of combining conversations to move to something uh, that, uh, you know, to move down a path of, uh, of shared understanding and uh, and to actually get to some kind of outcome. Weaving is, is connecting people together, weaving relationships across the network. That's a really key part of moving beyond that hub and spoke to that multi-hub. So connecting with people in the network, but then also connecting them together, understanding why people are there, what their motivations, their needs are, how they might want to engage, what they need to get out of it also to make it work for them and their organization, and then helping them find a way to plug in or connecting them with others where there might be some mutual benefit. And then coordination, which is that, that back, all the back of the house, all the, the technological infrastructure that, you know, supporting the, the development of teams and so forth. Um, and that really speaks to the last thing I want to share here and they'll stop again which is emergent structures. Networks do need some structure. It's just a, a minimum viable structure of just enough to provide support, like a trellis in a garden, but not enough to stifle emergence and creativity. 
right? Like a trellis in a garden, I say, because you know, uh, we're not forcing the plants to grow in a certain direction, but we can provide stakes and supports that the plants can, can hang on to as they grow, right? So you're kind of scaffolding as the network develops. Instead of building all this structure ahead of time, as the network is, is emerging, then we can build structures based on that. So kind of the form follows the function. And, that, and these basic structures might be mechanisms for forming teams, online communication platforms, how do we make collective decisions, what are our participation agreements, how do we gather and distribute resources, all different kinds of things. But again, minimum viable structure. So that was, that was a lot to answer in my question, but it was something I wanted to get to anyway, uh, which are these kind of key ingredients of impact networks. And um, this is all in part two of the book. So I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this since I know you talked about part one mostly in your conversation. So let me stop there uh, and hear you know, implications for SCURP and other questions that have come up. Yeah, thank you so much for, for providing that overview. I also wanted to jump back because I know there were at least uh, two questions earlier in chat that got lost with some of the conversation that came up there that I wanted to make sure uh, we did not go over. The first uh, was from Stephanie. She asked earlier on, I believe it was about your first graphic that you showed with the 204040. Uh, and okay. though I imagine this applies to a number of them, but um, if you think this diagram is static or moving, I think you can move from red to green in an instant due to a variety of factors. So is this meant to be sort of snapshot of a single moment in time uh, or how, how to think about that? Totally, definitely a snapshot in a given moment of time. People move from you know, these concentric, one concentric circle to another pretty regularly. One of the things that that we often do though to, to help us as organizers and coordinators of these networks is to ask people to recommit every so often, every year, maybe every six months, whatever your cycle is, ask people to, to commit that I want to engage at, you know, a leadership level for the next six months. Or I want to, I just want to, you know, I'm busy with all this other stuff, but I can follow the network for the next six months, right? So then we have at least some understanding, and people can still come in and out of those different different levels, but but it helps us as organizers understand where people want to plug in. Great, thank you. And yes, Stephanie, let us know if there's any, any additional follow-ups at this point. I also wanted to bring back to James's question, which is curious about the role that funding plays in network creation and growth. And one of the surprises of being in the Web3 space has been realizing how artificial some of these communities are, especially in the beginning due to the, uh, I'm guessing, and sorry if I'm reading into it, but due to that financialization of building that initial community versus the finding the people who already have the intrinsic motivation. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's hard to give one answer because funding play a lot of different roles depending on the incentive structures and all that kind of stuff and um, and whether you have a token or not. And but I will say, I think uh, some some degree of funding early on is really helpful to, to get things off the ground to kind of spark networks in the first place. And so my work in Converge often comes uh, from foundation funding. So foundations are sort of the R&D of the social sector in a way. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that they have decision rights and control over how the network is developing. So a lot of my work early on is, is really working with the, the funders to say, you know, just because you're providing some resources to support this network, it actually is critical that you're not controlling it and you're supporting people to, to, you know, to do what they can and want to do together, right? So, uh, and it's, you don't have the decision rights of who's going to be involved and, and all those kinds of things. It's really trying to then give that, that decision-making to the, the network and the community as soon as possible. And then over time, as networks begin to show their value for individuals, then it's more common for people, for networks to, to have things like membership dues or different types of contributions and uh, in-kind contributions from organizations and other ways. Um, you know, sometimes, it can take a little bit of time for a network to to show that direct value to people, um, but uh, which is why that seed funding early on is really helpful. Uh, but that does happen. Yeah, and there's one more question in chat from Tolu, and I feel like part of this will us as Scurp, we will just need some sessions to fully digest now that we've had more interaction with the book, and how does this actually impact how we think going forward? Uh, but uh, she raised the interesting question of, is it important for us to measure our impact in contributing to Web3 research? And if abstracting that a little, sort of what role, especially in the early days of these network formations, what role does trying to quantify and assess uh, versus, you know, are you feeling out the vibes or, you know, how quantitative or qualitative uh, is it useful to be at that kind of stage? 
Uh, and yeah, Tolo, if there's any specific follow-up you want to add there, please feel free to. But that was how, how I at least interpreted the question for today. Just pausing to see if there's any context I want to be added to that. I will say, I think uh, evaluating you know, the process metrics is really important uh, on the path towards, you know, we have these longer term ambitions and you know, it's a deeper discussion about how we're going to measure the outcomes around those. But but we can measure the, the growth and development of the network itself through things like social network analysis, which I've showed here, through participant surveys and understanding Know, the vibes, uh, how people feel like they're able to show up and contribute and have conversations. And you know, we have surveys on our website uh, to, you, to, to do those types of things. Uh, there, by the way, there are guides for these and a lot of other things at converge.net slash toolkit. Uh, it's an open source uh, toolkit with Creative Commons. Uh, so go ahead and use those. Um, so I definitely, uh, almost every time we, we do map the network and, and understand how it's growing and developing. And this is a good example of why. Uh, this was a, a map of a, a network that's an entire school district. The, the larger nodes here are staff members of the school district. And then the smaller nodes are parents who are like volunteering with the school in some way, had some type of volunteer interaction with the school. And the school is really interested in understanding its parent network. And the key finding here in this map uh, is that there's this community uh, of Hmong parents, particular ethnic community, which are the, the small dark black nodes here. Uh, and you can see the vast majority of parents from that community were only connected to the school through one staff member, which is circled there. Uh, and that was key because now the school's like, oh man, if we lose that staff member, we're also losing the connection to that entire community, right? It's a narrow bridge. So we need to widen that bridge. We need to diversify the connections between staff or the school and, and that community. And we need to make sure that we don't lose that staff member also. So you can also understand just how the network is evolving and where those, those points of fragility are if you do things like mapping. Thank you. So I think we're caught up on the what was the backlog of chat questions. So now I think we're, we're back to virtual hand raise. So Paul and Kaido will be next. So Paul, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, thank you. And uh, David, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, I am particularly interested in leadership, um, both SCURF as an organization, being a leader in this space of networks, but then also just kind of internally uh, and uh, particularly thinking of that 2040-40 of activity um, in these type of leadership positions, right? Like there must be something alluring to command and control if we kind of keep going back to command and control. And I kind of wonder if it might be like activity, right? So uh, very often for that very peripheral group, um, there might be really good ideas out there, but they don't have the time, resources, or, or um, mental capacity at that time. Um, and so a whole bunch of activity by that 20% makes their information maybe moot at that point, or they no longer feel like they have contributions there. So uh, what is kind of the responsibility or the best way to be that 20% to make sure that you're not constantly through the ability to take action, um, bulldozing right through opportunities to collaborate? Hmm. Well, it's, it's totally a nuance. And, uh, and this kind of gets to there are, there are there's common polarities uh, that are going to arise in this work. You might call it dynamic tensions, where you know, a, a number uh, that I can name now are like building trust and taking action. Both are important. People are going to have different orientations to both, but we need to hold both those polarities. The self-interest and the shared interest. We're often talking about what's the shared thing we're trying to create together, but actually we also have to really acknowledge and put on the table the self-interest that people have. What do I need to get out of this that serves me or my organization or my constituents so that I can participate in this effort, right? The short term and the long term participation and pace. We we want to move fast, but we also want to have broad participation. So these aren't, these aren't problems to be solved. They're just tensions to be aware of and held as we navigate. Uh, and, and that's really a key, I think, role of network leaders is to, to understand that these tensions exist and to name them. And you know when they arise, name them in the group, have conversations. You know, we're, we're talking about 
the, the trade-offs between this and that, but we can acknowledge that actually this is not a black and white polarity, right? Both are important. And so, and then it, and then the, just those different leadership roles, right? Then how do we facilitate a conversation among different groups and among different folks, I should say, in the group to uh, to come to some kind of resolution, right? Uh, how do we facilitate a decision-making process? Um, I, I often kind of lean on consent-based decision-making, which is, you know, if it's safe to try, we can move it forward. So it's sort of that bias for action. Um, but but I think that's that's really what leadership is about, is holding those different tensions. One other thing I'll <clears throat> mention here is that uh, a reason why it's, it's important to move beyond, when we're building networks, a reason why it's important to move beyond that hub and spoke stage is because if we stop at that stage, we're really just creating another hierarchy. If you look here, these two diagrams are structurally identical. They're just visualized differently. Uh, and so, you know, uh, being at the center of a hub and spoke and at the top of a hierarchy really has its benefits, right? You're in control, you're needed, but that's a double-edged sword. The more you control, then the, the less uh, able the system is to, to self-organize, the more you're needed, the less resilient it is in the case you aren't available. And so when we're building networks, we're trying to, you know, go to that uh, multi-hub or core periphery but that isn't to say that hierarchies are bad or inherently worse than networks because they're not. Hierarchies are really good at doing what they do best. When you have you know, a specific outcome that you know you're trying to achieve and it's kind of predictable, the path, you can fit people into specific roles, by all means, use a hierarchy, a hierarchical structure. Uh, and, and you can create hierarchies that aren't power hierarchies where a single person is dominating over others, but really kind of heterarchies that, are, that naturally arise based on you know, people's influence or relative context. Uh, and so people can be delegated the, the authority by the, the larger community to, to have different types of decision rights and leadership. And so I would say try to find the intersection, the integration of both hierarchies and networks when appropriate. Uh, a lot of hierarchies have built networks alongside the existing structure to do things that the hierarchy cannot. John Cutter called this a dual operating system. Um, so that's just, I just wanted to make sure we touched on that point that that this none of this means that hierarchies are bad. Hierarchies actually have their place. And, and so we can find the place for both. And I, I appreciate that in your book, you you do touch on the realities of pros and cons and, and not, I, I know in the web three space, there's frequently a, a kind of blind look at one side and not look at, yeah. So uh, appreciate the reality there. I know Kaido is next and then I wanna jump in with actually a follow up to the leadership question, but Kaido, I'll let you jump in first, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, uh, I'll make my question try to be brief. Uh, I have some thoughts on two, parts on your what you shared i think they're super fascinating on the since we're continuing this you know network and you know leadership question i just want to know if you have you heard about the orbit model i think you're describing something very similar to what they're proposing in, in some way i'll share the link here as well in chat if not no worries um uh the second one uh question i have it's on uh you know conveying the people i mentioned a little bit on chat i want to uh, running by you and want to hear your thoughts on it. So uh, I'm I'm quite deep in D-Side. Um, I don't agree with most people doing D-Side. There's uh, one project I, I really like, it's called VibeDAO. And the way they convey the people is through this token model to incentivize different people on a shared common goal. And the common goal is, you know, to, for one specific rare disease, uh, they can bring people together, the doctors, the patients, and the funders and the researchers when doing the actual research together to bring to market a drug to like, let's say phase two, and then uh, get by, bought out by some other companies. So those two examples, what do you think about them? Um, uh, yeah, would love to hear yeah. your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I have not heard of the orbit model, so I'm looking forward to digging into this. It's been kind of amazing. Uh, the I've been talking with a lot of people over the past year and and I feel like I did a lot of research before that, but then I still people are coming up with, you know, have you heard of this? Have you heard of that? And a lot of times I haven't. It's amazing. There's a lot of this work that's that's happening uh, all all across the the world. Um, and with different language, you know, and but but often the principle is the same. So yep. uh, I love seeing that. Um, yeah, the 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 financial incentives uh, to to bring people together is is interesting it's just you have to be careful with it i think because uh if if people are 
purely coming together for financial reasons, then when there's you know, a different price of the token or uh, or whatever it might be, it, it can create some perverse incentives and, and it's harder to build real kind of genuine trust and care for one another when the only thing you're connecting around is is an increase in financial returns. Uh, you know, I found in, in my work has been primarily focused in the social sector, right? And so there's uh, there's there's always some issue that brings people together. And and so even if people can't trust one another directly, they can trust the care they have for the thing of mutual concern, like the care of the place or the care of the issue or the people that they're trying to serve. And and that kind of deeper sense of purpose also has a way of engaging people at a, at a, at a different level and a deeper level, I think, than, than purely financial. Um, but uh, that said, uh, you know, maybe if done well, it can have a way of uh, engaging people in the first place that otherwise wouldn't have been engaged. And um, that's a big reason why I've started to get, you know, more and more into the space and really, you know, track DAOs and work with DAOs more because I've been really curious about how uh, these types of tools and tokens can can have a positive impact uh, on networks and communities. So it's definitely an open question that I'm still exploring as well. Thank you so much. I don't want to take any further yeah. time. Thanks for the questions and the, the resource. Yeah, and I wanted to to follow up to uh, to with a question pertaining to the leadership side, and uh, I guess at its core, really about uh, with the network uh, mentality or the network mindset shift. What is what have you actually seen be a useful instigator in that journey? Because I think for people comfortably embracing these various versions of leadership, one needs to already either be predisposed to want to do this stuff or be in a position where they are in an environment where they are told this is both expected and uh, appreciated when you do these things. And like, it, it's not you doing more than what as someone asked you to. It's no, we would love for you to do that. How, what's kind of the first step that you've seen of uh, helping people start that journey? Yeah, I think just getting into it and, and trying it and experiencing it, it's, it's been, it become a big kind of focus of my life and mission and mission career over the last 10 years to try to raise the profile of this this form of leadership which has you know other names facilitative leadership servant leadership level five leadership it's uh, often pointing to the same thing i call it network leadership but um but i i think the the people who who really support networks and communities in this way they're so often what what makes the difference, to be honest. Um, but they're so often behind the scenes and so quick to share the credit that they, I think, don't get the the kind of recognition or we don't provide the financial resources that that are, are really necessary, I think, to, to support them and sustain this type of work. Um, and so, uh, yeah, people, I think you have to learn this work uh, in two ways. Number one is just uh, by doing it and practicing it. And the second is in community with others. Uh, so I, I really believe that uh, network leaders should have um, a community of other uh, network leaders or community leaders that they can you know, support, uh, that they can have conversations with, that they can dig into because this work, it's its funny, it's so collaborative, you're constantly engaging with people, but at the same time, it can also be really isolating uh, because you're the only person, sometimes it feels like, who's thinking about the health of the network or the community as a whole. Uh, and uh, and you're you know, dealing with a lot of sort of behind the scenes, uh, personality conflicts or whatever it might be. Uh, it's really, really valuable to have a community of others. Um, so we've often built you know, networks of network leaders um, so that they can they can support each other in a community of practice, um, uh, and and yeah, it really Eugene, it really is a big mindset shift uh, because you know we're really sp speaking for myself, socialized in hierarchical ways of doing things through school and my initial jobs and all that stuff. So um, so operating this way can be can be a big shift, but I think just getting involved um, and trying and then and then uh, engaging in a community of of peers uh, is is key. And it's exciting to see projects like Kernel and others that are focused on part of that mindset shift in, in a different context. And um, but yeah, that's a whole separate topic. But I see there are two questions in chat. Let's see if we could at least get through one of them. So uh, this is very helpful. Thank you for Maria. In your experience, do you want to be clear on how we are structured as a company and within the network right from the get-go? Or can that evolve naturally over time? And how much of there is sort of shifting between you know types of network or things like that? 
Uh, I do think uh, you can certainly evolve over time and actually really uh, holding space for emergence is really important. So I talk about planning for emergence. We can have deliberate process and emergent results. Uh, we can deliberately organize ways of, of bringing people together, connecting them together, and that, that then we, we don't hold the results too tightly. We see what's emerging, and then we can follow the energy there and continue to build the structures that are necessary. On those different types of networks, learning network, action network, movement network, I've seen a lot of groups that uh, you know, want to get to action right away, and, and it's actually better to be a really vibrant learning network than it is kind of a middling action network. And so you know, use the, the simplest form that's going to suit your needs, and then you can always add more structures later. That's what I'll say there. Great. And hopefully we'll have at least a chance for Chris's question, which is as much as the book focuses on the necessity of trust, do you feel the notion of trustless systems itself are a linguistic hurdle for adoption? Yeah, I, 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 I believe uh, that uh, we're going to see there's there's really benefits in integrating both both trusting systems and trustless systems. Um, that's the other thing that's really brought me more into the space more as I wanted to explore how trustless systems can really support coordination at much much larger scales. You know, uh, at at beyond Dunbar's number, and you know, most of the networks that I've engaged with are somewhere between twenty and three hundred people, uh, where each person can still feel some sense of community with others. Um, and it's hard when you get at much, much larger scales when people have no shared understanding of who each other is uh, and, and no reason to trust them other than they're in the community. Uh, and so that's where I think trustless systems really come into play is when we get to those much, much larger numbers of coordination where we can't really build those, those same types of uh, relationships or have conversations or even know who's who else is in the group. Yeah, and then there was another question sort of at the start of network facilitation, how do you help facilitate relationships between individuals? I imagine just as we're coming to time, it might be tough to get into the actual nature of facilitation, but I know on the Converge site, if I'm not mistaken, y'all have some actual facilitation guides. Do you at least want to take that of pointing people in the direction of some resources uh, as we wrap up? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, again, our toolkit, converge.net slash toolkit, uh, we have uh, different activities. Uh, there's one, True Stories, uh, which is uh, really effective, used in so many different contexts. Also one called Rapid Coordination, which is really about uh, supporting people's self-interest in a short amount of time. So really immediately, how can we connect the dots so that people are supporting each other's existing work and getting value out of it and, and also providing offers to the community. So that's a really great way of creating value really uh, at the front end of a network's development. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, other, just look through that toolkit. We also have kind of deeper trainings uh, at Converge if you're interested in going deeper or, or exploring network leadership in more depth. We have a network leadership series that's starting again in September. This is gonna be the fourth time we've run it. So it's a, that's an eight week course. Awesome, well, thank you so much, David, for joining us today. Uh, and yeah, we really appreciate you spending time to, to present about the book and some of these concepts. Uh, really excited to delve into these in, in more detail over time. But yeah, we're already going a, a minute over. So I just want to be respectful uh, for those who are able to I'd actually ask. Let's just go off mute for a moment and just give an actual quick round of applause for David. And a thank you, because I, I did really enjoy that. So yeah, just thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Feeling like Appreciate it. Room together. Thank yeah. Thanks, Thanks for the good questions.